Thank you, Anthony, and, and uh, hello to all the conference delegates. Um, so we've been talking this morning or hearing about some of the world's tallest structures, and uh, I thought very interesting Mr. Hamoud's presentation bringing into to, uh, debate or discussion or context the issue of horizontal sprawl, uh, the challenges of how we can bring together sub-centers of cities to make them more livable. So um, I want to show a project which is quite a bit more modest in dimension, but still very important in defining a place. And that sense of place is critical for the making of centers in our cities. And here we find ourselves at the meeting of water and land, a fundamental geographical uh, kind of phenomenon that de defines the linear nature of the place in which Dubai finds itself. So uh, to replicate or to multiply in a way that condition of water and land and edge, about 10 years ago, the Palm Jumeirah was created, as you know, a landfill which created multiple spits of land to sort of make a surface area that uh, multiplied many times the, the linear stretch along, along the water. And this makes the location for the project I want to talk about. As Anthony mentioned, there will be a tour of the site, so you can see some of the construction tomorrow, which I, I hope will be exciting. But as you can see here, this building poses almost like a, a watercraft floating uh, between the Gulf and the lagoon. So it mediates between two sides of water. And while the proportion of the building is actually more horizontal than vertical, it's, about, it's only about a modest 250 meters tall, uh, but will be more than 500, maybe up to 600 at the podium meters long, it still, in a way, is a tall building. And this is an issue for the council. How do we think about the tall building when height is, is not its only distinguishing or its greatest distinguishing feature. So to, to think about the, the sense of a center, uh, we have to think about places that people want to be and they want to come uh, more than to see a structure, an object, a sculpture, but to experience as happens at the base of essentially what is a resort. This is a hotel and residential building, but it sponsors because of its population and tributary crowd that comes to the place all sorts of food, entertainment, and even semi-cultural functions. This shows you the base of the building. So um, back to the description of the discussion of large cities. London was discussed uh, earlier. Polycentric cities are made when edges are created that are far away from the center, as in parts of London that are far away from the Square Mile or the uh, Tower Bridge and were really suburban, but became centers over time. So this image of London in the 1930s shows us this kind of series of separate nodes, separate villages that come together to make a kind of cellular uh, amalgam of a whole. And so of the projects that we're involved with in London, we have very different challenges of inhabiting a part of the city of London, the square mile, or uh, on the contrasting uh, end of things on the West End at Earl's Court, a very different kind of architecture and urban response is called for. So these are multi-architectural, multicultural sort of uh, urban uh, challenges that we face. And uh, then to extend the discussion of nodes and centers uh, in projects to the vertical dimension, uh, a building which we finished about four years ago, and I think this has been a subject of some of the council's discussions, the Lotte Tower in Seoul. This is a 555 meter tower. And I think what distinguishes it architecturally is not only its height, but it's the way that the section of the building creates semi-public centers that move up the section of the tower. And so we've likened them to, and you can see here in a section here, that there is a concert hall on the 10th floor of the base of the building. So a 2,000 seat cultural uh, uh, destination that would normally be found at the end of a Grand Avenue is lifted up into the tower or the base of the tower. So this is really a series of vertically disposed nodes. Well, back to the geography of, of our uh, situation today, we see how these very, very important buildings and the, the beautiful Dubai Creek Tower was presented today 
uh, the Burj Khalifa. Our little building here, which you see as a kind of a, a series of Jenga blocks put together, although not dominant vertically, still defines a very, very important edge. It says that with all of these other structures that define networks, the network of flight of the Abu Dhabi airport, the, the network of money that re is represented by the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, um, and the ne ne literal networks of structure in uh, some of these towers, this little building will create as a kind of filter, visual filter between land and water, a sense of connected relationship. And then uh, even as the Emirates are a kind of uh, a clustering and a multinodal uh, subnational series of, of places, Dubai itself now is becoming uh, not just a line segment, but a series of subcenters. And uh, I think, as, as was described earlier, this process by His Excellency, this process of maturation of cities, we don't really understand and see ahead how these centers are made until they start to develop and pieces of the city find their appropriate place. So here we are out at the edge of the Palm Jumeirah in that orange dot. So I want to tell you a little bit about this project and just explain in a, in a modest way how it was conceived, how it is being constructed. The building, uh, which is, and we, we see this sort of analogy to a piece of coral, uh, is seen as a permeable structure, visually, uh, structurally, and in terms of its operation. It, it uh, mediates between the view uh, to the inside towards the land and the view towards the water. And so as we began the project, the project was undertaken by Kersner International and by the Investment Corporation of Dubai as a, a way to, in a way, counter some of the very, very sculptural attention-getting forms of the towers that, that line the sort of line segment of, of Dubai. And so in the client's mind was the idea that this could be something more fundamental in a way, a kind of building for the ages that would come from certain abstract principles of construction, geometry, and the making of buildings. And that's why the, the great Roman viaduct of Segovia inspired us. Because in a way, it's extremely daring, but it's also quite simple. Every bit of the module of stone, the repetition of archways, follows a kind of structural and constructional formula. And so you can see here on the right-hand side this, this rather simple form as contrasted to the existing uh, building of the first phase of Atlantis. So here's one of our first sketches thinking about uh, simply a series of domino-like pieces that are pulled apart uh, to create a kind of a balance somewhere halfway between something very solid and something ephemeral, uh, and then also mediating between the water below and uh, the lightness that comes with the meeting uh, towards the sky. So here, here is where the building will be when finished middle 2020. On the one hand, on the left-hand side is a hotel of about 800 rooms. On the right-hand side, a residential building of about 250 units, but they're more or less equivalent in the way that they handle modules, structure, services, and architectural form. In the middle, we find uh, the most open, the most permeable zone of the building, uh, somewhat of a literal archway, and at the top of that is a 60 meter long bridge that will be hoisted up. That will happen, I think, in sometime in January, February of this year. So that should be quite a spectacle for those of you who are, are living here in Dubai to go and see uh, this piece of prefabrication of structure being brought up into the height of the building. So just to step back for a minute to think about permeability, a building which had featured in, in some discussions uh, at CTBUH previously, which we had built in Hong Kong, the Haisan Center, is very much of an exercise in thinking about how a hole in a building can serve an urban context. Here in Hong Kong, winds are encouraged to come through the building, uh, this part of, of uh, Lee Gardens, Hong Kong, 
It's, it's, a, it's a kind of a ventilator of the part of the city that's up against the hill and the harbor. And that provides a sort of urban environmental function along with the possibility of vertically stacked gardens. If you could play the video now, this is just a, a very simple uh, diagrammatic uh, evocation of the way in which the design of the building was conceived early on. And I don't know if this moves, uh, if the uh, video guys can make that move. If not, we'll go to the next uh, image. I guess not. It's not, not critical. Um, oh. Okay. Oh. Yeah, well, oh, there we go. Okay. So, you know, simply put, uh, we could have achieved the same area, the same tributary area in a couple of slabs. And instead, the pulling apart lengthened, it created more surface area, as I mentioned before. And this double curvature was essential to saying that this building faced two ways it faced water to the Gulf and water to the lagoon. Um, it has a way then of saying there is a center beyond even if the building itself is much more of an edge. Okay, so we'll move on to the next image. The, the notion of a building where literally dwellings or hotel rooms where we dwell temporarily can give us a sense of the romance of living in a house that has been lifted up into the sky uh, is part of the great objective of the project. So we see here the... Uh, um, it's a David Hockney painting, I believe. And this is a case study house. It's either a Soriano or a Koenig house uh, in LA. But there is this dream, which we know from the West Coast, of living indoors and outdoors in a kind of balanced life. And so um, here, if we were to look out to the distance and see the horizon line and see the sky meet the water, th there's a poetry in the kind of uh, natural condition of the surrounding which we want to capture not only at the larger apertures, but also in a series of sky gardens that occur. There are 40, uh, 60 pools, rather, sprinkled around at upper levels outdoors of a sizable dimension in this project, and 90 swimming pools altogether. So this sort of balancing between public structure or collective structure and private moments where you almost have your own house uh, is illustrated, and the pools are, are pulled up off the structure high enough to create some depth so that when in the pool, we can find ourselves in this sort of uh, outdoor area, and the, the pool itself is a thick, lucite structure, the, uh, the walls of which then allow us to be underwater, 40 stories in the air, looking at the skyline. So it's a moment of a kind of... Uh, that individual bliss, let's say, of, of being in a very, very unusual, vertically lifted uh, uh, spot of, of something between being in a city and being in a resort on the water. Now, the, the outdoor spaces are numerous. That The whole point is to create as many opportunities as possible for this, this feeling of, of elevated water. So there are uh, sky courts that are roughly 20 meters by 20 meters by 20 meters carved in four pieces. There are edge cantilevered roof surfaces. And there are some that are large enough so they become really a public gathering party destination. So these will be places for 100 or more people to gather uh, uh, on top of ridges and on top of roofs of the building. An early sketch of the feeling of being inside one of these structures uh, where we would tile the edges with terracotta to give the sense of some kind of uh, more real uh, urbanism of, the, of uh, light and texture that is, is uh, more rewarding than it's simply a glass surface. The addition of, of planting to, again, uh, re-evoke this sense of being on the ground, even though we're in the air. And then eventually what this is built to, be, to become with this, the selected different colors of uh, terracotta and precast and pool below. Very important part of this, the engineers, here, WSP serving structural mechanical engineers, but also RWI studies of the wind systems or the wind effects through these apertures was critical because, uh, yes, the wind is encouraged, but perhaps in some places too much so, you would feel 
uh, blown too hard through these sky decks. So we've mitigated that with some two and a half to three meter uh, low iron glass parapets at some point so we can feel comfortable in these places. And uh, then you see how the decks and these modules of smaller individual units come together. And then seen in perspective, we've architecturally revealed away some of these larger boxes from each other to give them the visual effect seen from outside of floating. And then the depth of the wall, this is done with uh, a precast concrete, is pushed back or the building is pulled forward to create a series of egg crate-like shades. And uh, that has a significant effect on the environmental properties of the, the sun beating into the building, and it allows us to use a rather transparent glass uh, in the end because there's so much uh, sort of remediation of sun on the right-hand side, the, as you can imagine, cooler uh, areas of, of surface effect of sun because of this depth of Brie Soleil. And you can see individually here, uh, the sort of without the shading devices on the left, with the shading devices, and as we all know, the deep architecture of uh, the climate that we find ourselves in is part of a cultural heritage, and it's something that we believe makes sense and belongs also in contemporary architecture rather than the sleek glass wall. And so looking up at the way the building will take shape, uh, very, very simple, almost elemental and reductive. You could describe this building in a few sentences or a few equations of lines, boxes, and curves, and we're done. And we didn't want it to be fussy or uh, overwrought. And now we come to the construction, which again, I hope many of you will see tomorrow, uh, to show you how the beams, the uh, pre-cambered steel beams, are being lifted up uh, between these towers. Uh, it's a conventional, rather conventional, concrete deck system. And then you see these deeper beams spanning across this 20 meter void, which creates the Sky Villa swimming pool courts, which you see here in orange. And now uh, in the construction, this must have been taken a month or so ago. At the end, there are cantilevers, which are somewhat uh, prefabricated in steel. Originally, it was thought that the whole cage of these elements could be prefabricated. That's been uh, a bit uh, uh, mediated by some of the construction um, realities. But, but in the end, we can think of this building with all of its elevator cores. We can think of it as six buildings, or we can think of it as one building. And so this question of how we define a tall building how we think about clusters coming together is, is, I think, in an interesting way challenged by this project. It is, even though it's not gigantic, it's uh, a megastructure in a way, in a, in a very helpful way that allows for a redundancy and also a situation in the hotel where we don't have endless corridors with 100 rooms uh, facing each other, but rather a sort of individualized uh, vertical village one, two, three, four, five, six. So to finish, uh, here again, these bridges, before they begin to really have a lot of meat on them and define this connective tissue, uh, but it's, it's interesting that the uh, design process and the construction process follow a, a sort of similar trajectory of thinking. And the building such as it will be, it'll appear from the inner part of the palm, Jumaira. And then finally, to return to this idea of a building that really is about its geography, mediating between land and sea, almost pretending to be a piece of geological making itself, as if it were a cliff or some piece of heavy rock that came onto this isthmus. And uh, eventually, in the discussion about the architecture and urban planning of the polycentric city by defining strongly an edge, by giving a sense of place and location to the spit of land, encourages us to see that 
the energy in Dubai is not only along the line segment, but is pulled out to various edges and points that then allow, in the future, a kind of aggregation of activity, commerce, culture, and society to happen in multiple places. Thank you.